Hey, it's Taurus with all the books. Welcome back to the Tower of Doom Trials. These are the books that are on trial. So in the interest of having um, short videos that I like, especially during Vlogmas, I'm going to break this into three segments, the trial segments. So those will be um, boring buzzwords today. And then um, I'm going to bring Marie Kondo back again to spark some more joy. And then finally, we will have um, mental clutter. And then I'll wrap it up with a fifth installment, which will be my plans for the Tower of Doom. The Tower of Doom. <laughs> yeah. So, if you didn't see the... Um, First, the intro to this um, little competition here. Is it a competition? Trial? <sighs> Sudden death. Um, if you didn't see the introduction, I will link it below so that you can watch that first and know what the heck I'm talking about right now. Because hopefully that clarifies it. <laughs> anyway, um, Sean, the book maniac, has graciously agreed to join me in these um, trial segments. So we are doing the page 112 tag, which he, you know, brought to BookTube a couple years ago now. And I don't think I've ever done it. So this will be my inaugural run with the page 112 tag. And Sean is joining me along in that. So anyway, Today's topic is buzzwords. A lot of people have buzzwords that get them excited about books. I, on the other hand, have buzzwords that bore me. These are the things that I go, ooh, no, I'm not interested. These are my boring buzzwords. Let me just share them with you briefly here. We have magicians tightrope walkers, domestic issues, domestic sagas, um, pursuit of wealth, modern icons fictionalized, medieval time period, westerns, political intrigue, um, lost at sea or lost in space, 9-11 and school shootings, self-absorbed characters, clunky dialogue, dangling modifiers, simplistic nonfiction, courtroom drama, repetitive phrasing, um, Groundhog's Day scenarios, 24 to 48 hours fictionalized, and philosophy. I'm sure there are a few more things. Um, some of these are not necessarily boring. I just find them traumatic. Some of them annoy me. You get the picture. But these are just things that I don't tend to like. There are obviously exceptions, there are always exceptions, but by and large, these things turn me off. So, some of these books have those things, <laughs> some do not. Um, some of those things can be found by reading the jacket of the book. Some of them you have to actually read the text, so page 112 will come in very handy for that. So, um, I have analyzed the blurbs and Goodreads on all of these books prior to filming. And now I am going to just check Sean's video clips that he's sent me. And I'm just, I'm not going to overthink this. You know, I like to overthink everything, but not going to over, overthink this one little thing. I'm just going to Grab these books in the order in which Sean has sent the videos. So we're going to do three today and then save the other six for the other two videos. The bottom two um, Sean has not read because when I was perusing Goodreads, I found out what he thought of them. Okay, sorry that cut off a little abruptly. I was filming on my iPhone as I always do. I'm filming here. Really? Getting on my nerves 
dude. Anyway. See. Oh. oh, now the little one's gonna get involved, I think. Oh, dear. She's sniffing. Oh, peekaboo. Boo boo. Boo baby. I got the ceiling in my shot. Whatever. Was it there before? Okay. Okay, so where was I? I don't know. Um, the first one that Sean read page 112 of was Amos Oz Judas. And I will go ahead and tell you. Uh, this one is translated, so I do prioritize those. So I'm already predisposed to keeping this one. This was um, published in 2014 in the U.S. Uh, it has a 3.85 rating on Goodreads out of 5,153 reviews. This is set in Jerusalem in the 59, 1959-1960. And it's a young biblical scholar um, living with a um, senior gentleman as the caregiver. And yeah, it focuses on Israel and Judas, the Bible stories. I think I'm going to like this one. Um, I don't like philosophy, but I do really like religion. And so... I like the intersections of religions. So let me just read page 112 real quick. And then we'll see what Sean thinks. Oh, it's a shorty. It's the introduction to a chapter. Atalia found Shmuel sitting at the desk, bent over an old book he had borrowed from the National Library. She, oh, let me... Let me stop and um, show you what I'm reading. That would be better for you. Atalia found Shmuel sitting at the desk, bent over an old book he had borrowed from the National Library. She was wearing a light colored skirt and a blue pullover that was too big for her and gave her a warm, homey look. Her face looked younger than her 45 years. It was only her veined hands that betrayed her age. She sat down on the edge of his bed leaned back against the wall, crossed her legs, straightened her skirt, and said without apologizing for this sudden invasion of his territory. You're working. I'm disturbing you. What are you reading? Yes, please, Shmuel said. Do disturb me. I really want you to. I'm tired of this work. In fact, I'm tired all the time. I'm even tired when I'm asleep. How about you? Are you free? Shall we go out for a little walk? It's a bright day outside, the sort of winter's day that you only get in Jerusalem. Shall we go out? Ignoring the invitation, Atalia said, Are you still doing research on stories about Jesus? Jesus and Judas, Jesus and the Jews, Shmuel said. How Jews down the ages have seen Jesus? And why do you find that so interesting? Why not how, say, why not how they saw Muhammad or Buddha? It's like this, Shmuel said. I can easily understand why the Jews rejected Christianity, but Jesus wasn't a Christian. He was born and died a Jew. It never crossed his mind to found a new religion. Sorry, this is a bit haphazard, but this is a book that one of the two um, that I wasn't sure if Sean would like uh, because I know several of Sean's boring buzzword triggers and religion's not one of his um things that he likes to read about often um so I was surprised when I opened up his video which I will play in just a minute um and he was gushing about it and then I realized because that opening was very religious to me um, and then I realized that this one, I, instead of sending him page 112, I had sent him page, um, 
121 so that it would be a regular full page. Oops. So I'm not going to read that to you as well because he mentioned some parts of it, but I'm going to turn the page for Sean real quick. He he ends with, he didn't belong in our time. He may have come too late. He may have been ahead of his time. He belonged in a different time. So, okay, this is all out of whack, but I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you, this is a keeper. So, this is gonna go in the keeper sack and I will play Sean's um, reactions because they really encouraged me about reading it as well. So, stay tuned for those. Okay, I really like this, actually. I felt really pulled down into the sadness of the man Shmuel. Is Shmuel, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, as he's out walking with Italia and realizing that their relationship is... I don't know if they had a relationship that's now finished or if there's no possibility to start a relationship, but whatever had gone on before this, that nothing's going to happen after this. And his sadness is palpable. His inner dialogue really worked for me. I was struck by, I'm guessing this might be a translation, but I was struck by suddenly his hand reached out and his fingers stealthily stroked the back of her neck that the subject is the anatomical parts, not the man himself. And that gives a nuance to that action in a way that just kind of thrills me. I love the atmosphere. They're walking they crossed Agrippa Street and they walked the length of Mahan Yehuda Market. I Sorry, pronunciation, I don't know. But all of the detail about what that smelled and looked and tasted like was fantastic. And then what an enigmatic ending. Atalia says to Shmuel about her father. He didn't belong in our time. He may have come too late. Gah, I want to turn the page! Okay, the next one, hopefully I can be a little more polished and professional with this one. Um, Let the Great World Spin by Cullum McCann. So obviously this is a celebrated novel, uh, National Book Award winner, but do you see something on that cover? <laughs> Tightrope Walker. <sighs> um, this was published in 2009. It has a 3.95 rating out of 87,707 reviewers. So well regarded on Goodreads. Uh, this is set in 1974 in New York City. It has a large cast of characters, uh, but a lot of downtrodden type topics amongst those characters. So we're gonna switch it around and listen to Sean's thoughts first, and then I'll read page 112 and they see what I think. But there's some tension here with this one, no pun intended. Okay, my hot take on, uh, oh, Doris, here I am talking about the one that starts with the sergeant coughed into a closed fist. Wow, I like this one even more. I really like the last one, and this one just... Gah! Uh, the sergeant coughed into a closed fist. I mean, it starts out with that, and it just goes with... The, that was the word, slide, you don't die a fucking hero. And I have no idea what's going on, but I am so... I am so intrigued. Um, the the uh, dialogue with the, with the dash... And all the time I was just smiling, see, you poor thing. Is that Solomon and Claire? Because the dialogue earlier is italicized, and this is indented with a, a, an M dash before each line. So who's speaking there? Claire, obviously, is one, but is she talking to somebody else about this meeting with Solomon? I'm not sure about that, but it was still really intriguing. Uh, I just love the writing here. It strikes her deep and hard and shivery. He was up there out of a sort of loneliness. What his mind was, what his body was, a sort of loneliness. With no thought at all for death. If you're not going to read this one, Doris, I am. Okay, I have listened to Sean's comments, but I'm going to read this to you first. The sergeant coughed into a closed fist. A liar's gesture. 
They were still collecting the details, the sergeant said, but Joshua had been at the cafe, sitting inside. They had all been warned, all the personnel about the cafes. He was with a group of officers. They had been to a club the night before. Must have been just blowing off steam. She couldn't imagine that, but she didn't say anything. Her Joshua at a club? It was impossible, but she let it slide. Yes, that was the word, slide. It was early morning, the sergeant said, Saigon time. Bright blue skies, four grenades rolled in at their feet. He died a hero, the sergeant said. Solomon was the one who coughed at that. You don't die a fucking hero, man. She had never heard Solomon curse like that before, not to a stranger. The sergeant arranged his hat on his knee, like his leg might be the thing now that needed to tell the story. Glancing up at the prince above the couch, Miro, Miro, on the wall, who's the deadest of them all? He pulled his breath in, his throat looked corrugated. I'm very sorry for your loss, he said again. When he had gone, when the night was silent, they had stood there in the room, Solomon and Claire, looking at each other, and he had said they would not crack, which they hadn't, which she wouldn't. No, they wouldn't blame each other. They wouldn't grow bitter. They'd get through it, survive. They would not allow it to become a rift between them. And all the time, I was just smiling, see? You poor thing. That's awful. But it's understandable, Claire. It really is. Do you think so? It's okay, really. I just smiled so much, she says. I smiled too, Claire. You did? That's what you do. You keep back the tears. Gospel. And then she knows now what it is about the walking man. It strikes her deep and hard and shivery. It has nothing to do with ang angels or devils, nothing to do with art or the reformed or the intersection of a man with a vector, man beyond nature, none of that. He was up there out of a sort of loneliness. What his mind was, what his body was, a sort of loneliness with no thought at all for death. Huh. Okay, I think this with the dashes is a conversation between Solomon and Claire. And yeah, I like the writing. And this is about the tightrope walker. And I like the theme being discussed here. So yeah, I'm really into theme and stories. So if this is more about the, the thematic implications of the tightrope walker and less about reading about the tightrope walker, maybe. I'm not having any instant thoughts about this one. So I think I am going to create a maybe pile. <laughs> So, one more in this video. Hang okay, with me. Okay, so the last one for today is The Enchanted by Renee Denfeld. My soul left me when I was six. It flew away past a flapping curtain over a window. I ran after it, but it never came back. It left me alone on wet, stinking mattresses. It left me alone in the choking dark. It took my tongue, my heart, and my mind. When you don't have a soul, the ideas inside you become terrible things. They grow unchecked like malignant monsters. You cry in the night because you know the ideas are wrong. You know because people have told you that. And yet none of it does any good. The ideas are free to grow. There is no soul inside you to stop them. When I left the state mental hospital at 18 and the wind chased the papers from my hands and I walked until I found that house, I thought maybe my soul was hiding behind the fluttering cloth over the window. My soul was not there. The ideas were there, and the ideas hatched into something too terrible to name. I had good attorneys, even for back then. They were not like Grimm and Reaper. They hired a man who had the same job as the lady. The man brought in witnesses. Some of the jurors cried. I listened to the witnesses, the social workers, the neighbors, even my grandparents, looking so very old and sad through a veil of hair. The newspapers said I was without emotion. How could I have emotion hearing my life played backward? When the jurors came back and said no death, the attorneys slapped me on the back while behind me I heard a woman groan. The attorneys said a life sentence was unheard of in cases like mine. I actually really liked that. Um, I liked the cadence, the rhythm of the writing. Uh, I felt like 
I was able to read that aloud just cold um, without many stumbles. It just had a nice flow to it. And again, I like thematic writing, so this one really resonates with me. Um, it's published in 2014. It has a 3.96 on Goodreads out of 17,145 reviews. And this is a booktube darling. I just, for a backlisted book, I hear it mentioned um, in positive tones quite often. This has magical realism in it. And that is another Sean trigger, like as in, ew, I don't like that trigger. So I don't know. I kind of feel like he'll pick up on some of that from page 112. Unlike the other book, um, Amosaz. I think this page 112 had some thematic things that he doesn't like. Uh, this is A Man on Death Row. We actually heard that. And something about ancient prisons. Um, a journalist. And it's short. So let's see what Sean thinks. I wasn't as taken with this one. Uh, the story, whatever, what indications are of what the story is, is quite intriguing. I'm not fond of the writing uh any piece of writing that keeps referring to somebody's soul is a turn off it's not because i'm not religious it's just that word is such a cliche and just so hackneyed can't you talk about it without using that word please but there were some things like vivid wet stinking mattresses uh the fact that I, I don't know if it's a man. I'm assuming it's a man. He left the state mental hospital 18. So there's a story here that I'd like to know more about, but I'm not fond of the writer. I'm not fond of the writing. Uh, didn't quite work for me. So there you go. I did like that wet stinking mattress phrasing as well. Um, and soul doesn't resonate as cliche with me, I think because um, growing up in the Southern US, I've grown up in a very religious environment. And so that's a common um, term of discussion and not a cliche for me. So yeah, and spoiler alert, <laughs> this one is definitely getting a tryout because um, I noticed Vicky from chapter 32 is reading it this month, so we've got a buddy read scheduled now. So this one goes in the keeper pile as well. So stay tuned. I will be back with um, episode three, which will um, have another visit from my imaginary friend, Marie Kondo. So yes, we have one in the maybe pile and two keepers already and um how many is that six more to stand trial no sudden deaths yet so stay tuned i will be back soon bye